Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we're going to be listening to a compilation of some true scary stories. I hope you enjoy them. So without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. This story happened around three years ago, around the time that COVID started, so it was a while back, but still worthy of a post. It was early 2020, and I had just gotten a new job in a small town near my area. While looking for a place to live, my sister offered to rent her house to me. She had bought the house two years prior, but she and her husband didn't really take to it, and their commute to work was long, so they moved out and the house was uninhabited. Luckily for me, it was actually pretty close to my workplace, only around a 40-minute drive, and my sister pretty much rented it to me for free. I just paid for the water and electricity and looked after the house. I was living there for a solid two or three months and had already gotten used to it. One night, after coming back from work and parking my car, as I walked towards my door, I noticed something odd. There was a cigarette butt on the curb to my house. I leaned down and picked it up, thinking that it might have been mine since I'm a smoker. But after looking at the brand name, I realized that it wasn't mine and threw it away. I didn't think much of it and just shrugged it off as some butthole throwing it on my curb. I went on my night and nothing unusual happened. Two days later, I was once again walking to my house when I spotted a few more cigarette butts, this time near my porch. Needless to say, I was angry and thought that someone sat on my porch and smoked. But since I didn't know who it was, there was nothing I could do about it. I noticed that they were put out pretty recently, so whoever it was probably walked off as I was approaching. That night, I was watching a movie on my laptop, and it was pretty late past 1 a.m., so I was surprised when I heard a car passing by. It's a suburban neighborhood and it was COVID, so people rarely ventured out at night, but I didn't think much of it. Around half an hour later, I was surprised when I heard chattering nearby. I listened intently, but I couldn't hear what they were talking about, as their voices seemed almost muffled and quiet. By this point, I was getting a bit unnerved, so I stopped the movie and quietly got off of my sofa and walked to the front door to make sure that it was locked. As I was approaching the door, I froze mid-step as I heard the two approaching my porch and reducing their talking to a whisper. I realized right away that whoever this was wanted to break in. I leaned against my front door and waited, expecting a loud bang against the door or the doorknob being shaken, but it was oddly quiet. I decided to walk over to my window to see if they had walked away or changed their mind. My windows have bars from the inside out that you have to unlock so that you could move the curtains or look out the window comfortably. I slowly unlocked the bar mechanism and lifted it up. I moved the curtains and was taken aback. Leaning up against my window was a man. He was as startled as I was, because he basically stuttered over his own steps as he jumped back. He tightened his hoodie to cover his face, so all I could really see was his big blue eyes staring at me. His friend realized what was going on, and right away started to kick the door in. He kicked it a solid four or five times, but the door wouldn't budge. All the while, I was staring at them frozen in fear, trying to comprehend the situation. I snapped out of it and slammed the bars over my window, locking them and running upstairs to the storage room, where I pushed a table up to the door and called the cops. As I listened and expected the two to come inside at any minute, I heard a loud crash and the bars from the windows being shaken aggressively. When they realized that they couldn't get in, one of them let out a long, angry scream that probably woke up half the neighborhood. By the time the cops came, they were long gone. The police couldn't find out who it was, but they were more active in the neighborhood in the following weeks. Regardless, I wasn't too keen on staying there, so shortly after I moved out. 
My sister sold the house a few months later, and as far as I know, nothing similar ever happened since. So I took my dog out on a walk yesterday. It was overcast, but daytime, and we hadn't been out long. We were still close to home. My dog was sniffing away at a patch of grass, and I'm watching him and sort of just daydreaming, waiting for him to be done. Really quickly out of nowhere, he jumps up and spins around, facing the path behind us. I thought that he'd spotted another dog, but no. I turn around and there's a man sort of crouched down low, doing a really over-exaggerated sneak towards us. It honestly looked like something out of a cartoon. I was just stunned, and my dog was standing there with all of his fur puffed up. Didn't have a chance to say, hey, what are you doing or anything, because as soon as we caught him sneaking towards us, he turned around and ran off. If this had happened on one of our night walks, or early morning ones when it's dark, I think I would have had a heart attack. It was freaky enough during the day and close to home. I'm not really sure what he would have done if he'd managed to sneak right up to us, or why he thought that he'd even be able to. My dog is a German Shepherd, so I usually feel quite safe while walking him. I'm not sure if this belongs or not, so if not, just let me know. When I, a 31-year-old female, was 16, I was in a choir at my high school that performed for a lot of different events around town. One of them was to sing at the middle school's sporting events. The middle school in my hometown, there's only one, is just about a half a mile from my local childhood home. So whenever we had events there, I walked. I didn't get my license until I was 17. This one night, I think it was November, we had to sing at a basketball game, and it was obviously dark when I was able to leave. Normally, I wasn't allowed to walk alone at night, but for choir, I was given permission unless I felt unsafe. But there wasn't any reason to be creeped out at first, so I started my walk. Just down from the middle school is a stretch of road with almost no street lights that has always creeped me out when walking. I crossed quickly and had a fast pace going as I am a naturally paranoid human. About two minutes into the dark zone, I heard rapid footsteps behind me. I at first figured that it was just a jogger, but they made no attempt to pass me and just stayed a comfortable, for them, 10-foot distance. They began whistling a jaunty tune, which at first I thought was fun. At this point, I wasn't super scared, perhaps because of the happy whistling tune, but I noticed the footsteps began to speed up. There were no cars on the road, and given the lack of light, when I turned around, all I could see was a silhouette shrouded in darkness. At that realization, I quickened my pace to barely under a run. The whistling continued getting more breathless as this person began to run after me. I looked back to see a dark figure coming at me full speed, and in terror began to run frantically as well. I will never forget those last moments, running through my dark subdivision, hearing his whistling and footsteps getting closer and closer. This person followed me up to my door. I ran inside and locked the front, checked all other doors and went to my upstairs bedroom. From the window, I could still see a silhouette and could still hear them whistling. I slept with my knife that night. this seems like the right place to tell this story. It happened back in 2013. It was about eight or nine o'clock and I was on my way home from a pals. 
I was sat upstairs at the back of the bus. There was only me and one other person on the top floor of the bus, and he was sat near the front on the opposite side. When I got up to get off the bus and walked from the back towards the stairs, he called me. I don't remember exactly how he asked, but he was asking for a lighter. I walked up to him going through my pockets and told him that I had matches and handed them to him. He took them from me and just stared at them for a good few seconds and then handed them back to me and said something along the lines of, don't worry about it. The time it took him to decide not to use them felt very strange and the eye contact before and after just felt intense. I got walked down the stairs thinking, what the heck was up with that? And I got off the bus. I told a couple of people how weird it felt and described what he was wearing. A zip up black hoodie with a knockoff Hardy style tiger on the chest. Fast forward about a week and there's a fatal stabbing on a bus in my city. A young girl on her way to school was stabbed to death on the top deck of a bus. Stabbings are pretty common in my city. But a young girl being killed on her way to school, that's big news anywhere. They show a photo of the suspect being arrested, but you can only see the back of his hoodie. Straight away, I think that's the exact same Ed Hardy knockoff and was just wondering if it was the guy that I had seen. When they released more photos of him from the front, I knew that it was him. The scary thing is, it transpired and he had recently been let out of a mental health facility. He hadn't been given any support and had been sleeping rough on buses. I've had many interactions with mentally ill people and dangerous individuals, but this is one that stays with me. Even though the interaction was much, it felt so strange. I always wonder if he was seeing how I reacted when he asked me, hence why he didn't use the matches. Who knows? It's just a sad story, really. Rest in peace to the poor girl who was unalive. Her name was Christina Edkins. She was only 16 years old. This happened over a decade ago. My ex and I decided to hitchhike across California because we were bored and homeless and had nothing better to do. We stopped in a small town and found a little stream underneath a bridge. My feet were hurting really bad, so I took my shoes off to cool them in the water, and that's when I noticed movement in the bushes to my left. A strange man walked out staring at me. He made a movement with his finger, as if he wanted me to go into the bushes with him. I froze, and I yelled for my ex who was on the bridge waiting for me. He came running, but the man was already gone. It was insanely creepy, but I'm used to weird things happening to me, because I look much younger than my actual age. I know that he must have thought that I was a child. It's unnerving to think that someone could be comfortable enough to do that in the daytime. And that is why I never go exploring by myself. I live in an apartment building, and I guess there was a girl with a name similar to mine with long brown hair who moved in, and she was going on dates at her apartment through the internet. He thought that I was her, and he followed me into my apartment. He said he went down to look at the register in the lobby and saw my name. Yes, we have first and last names posted for deliveries, and our names were really similar, i.e. like Kristen and Christine, or Brianna and Brianne. Anyway, he followed me like I said, and then looked down at the registry downstairs and just assumed that I was this woman. So he knocks on my door. I answer it and he tells me that it's his birthday. Now keep in mind, I have no idea about any of this. And so I say, oh, okay, happy birthday. 
So then he says that he would give me $60 to go and hang out with him and his friends. And that if I wanted to, quote unquote, party, he would supply it for me. And that he and his friends would pay me for anything, quote unquote, extra. I was completely confused. I said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? I don't want to go to your birthday party. I don't even know you. To which he replied, well, I saw your ad on the internet and replied and you gave me this address and I saw you and blah, blah, blah. He tells me the story like I described in the beginning of this post. I said, no, that's not me. I am not that type of person. Seriously, so strange and creepy. Edit. To be honest, I was still somewhat perplexed until I told a neighbor a few months later. And apparently this woman got booted from the building because of the traffic to her apartment. I'm glad that the management didn't get us confused, as we live on different floors. The complaints of traffic were specific to her apartment. Thank goodness. Did I overreact? Or was this actually super dangerous? A few days ago, I went out for a smoke in the park with my bike. It was already 10 p.m. on a Thursday, and I was looking for a spot to light up my joint. Near the park is a playground, and it's a less populated area of the park, especially at night. Most likely because there are no lights in that spot. So I go there with my bike, get off my bike, and stop there to light up my joint. At that moment, I only hear steps approaching me. I turn back and I see a person, probably male, six foot tall, walking towards me. It was dark, and I couldn't see a face or what exactly he wore. I also looked only for an instant and rushed away with my e-bike. Now here is the chilling and confusing part. That person didn't use the road, He walked through the playground towards me. The playground had gravel stones. That was the only reason that I was able to notice that person walking towards me. I also noticed him when he was just about 10 feet away from me. So I wonder why he didn't accelerate when he was so near me. He didn't make any other noise, like saying good evening or laughing at me. When I rushed away, I thought about turning back with my lights on to see who that person was. And I was too afraid. I'm still wondering why someone is alone in the dark on a playground, walking towards me, a stranger, not using the road, and not saying anything. So a bit of a backstory first. Me and some friends knew this guy over the summer because one of my friends was cheating on her boyfriend with him. He knew, so there wasn't like any animosity between him and us. But the guy was always a creep. For example, I have scars on my arm. Not bad at all. You have to look really close to see them. But this guy was looking close. Like I could feel his stare burning a hole through my arm kind of close. He was also very touchy with my underage friends. I kind of freaked out and made sure that none of my friends went around this guy. So flash forward to now. I'm in a store, 6.32 p.m., and it's nighttime. I'm buying fresh scooped ice cream for me and my mom, and I'm about to walk home. Then this guy walks in and says, hey, with the most blank, creepy voice ever and you know when you see into someone's eyes and there's nothing like I mean nothing in their eyes yeah that was this guy like I mean mega seriously uncanny valley so I'm starting to ignore it that's when bro is like what's you gonna do I'm in a store so I walk out with my ice cream I take the back worker entrance because my mom works there. 
it wasn't her shift. And this guy follows me. Like, I don't know why he would. My hair was a mess and I was wearing sweatpants and a hoodie with chocolate stains on it. So I keep walking fast. And this dude is still following me. So I make it to the bend of my road. Now he does too. I'm halfway down and a car has to pass through. So he watches me go home from the edge of my road. What a creep. And my mom's response? Huh, I'm sorry that happened. And she went back to watching TV. Now I have to walk to the bus stop. But I'm super scared because it's dark out. There's an abandoned house that you can get into on the way. You could hide in there. And I know this dude has a crap ton of time on his hands to do something like this. I'm only 16. I just want to be on time to first period so that I don't get a detention. As I was walking home from work last night, about halfway to my house, a disheveled man who looked to be either homeless or extremely down on his luck crossed paths with me from the other side of the sidewalk. He had initially been walking in the opposite direction, but as soon as he saw me, he immediately turned around and started following me. He began rambling incoherently and aggressively, and his words were so slurred that I hardly understood a thing that he said. All I could make out was something about a care package and look at you. It was obvious that this man was under the influence of multiple substances. I quickened my pace and tried to avoid any eye contact with the man, and he was getting agitated that I wasn't paying attention to him. When my walking speed got too quick for his inebriated stumbling to keep up with, he stopped talking and instead began just trying to follow me. I kept looking over my shoulder at him, and every time I saw him, he would either stop or try to duck behind a bush. Finally, I started outright sprinting and looking for a spot that I could hide in myself. I came up to my local mosque and tried to sneak around the corner into the parking lot of it, where there was a tree that I had hid behind. While hiding there, I frantically dialed 911. I told them that a strange man displaying unstable behavior was trying to follow me and describe my location, myself, and the man to them. The dispatcher assured me that officers were on their way to where I was, but while waiting for them, I saw a figure heading up the sidewalk in front of the parking lot that I was hiding in. Panic immediately filled me, until the passerby was close enough that I could see that it was not the same man who had just bothered me, and they turned out to be harmless. Mere moments after this, the cops arrived to where I was, pulled up next to the tree, and motioned for me to come out and talk to them. The officer driving the vehicle asked me the standard questions, a description of the incident, where I was when it happened, etc. While we were talking, he spotted a man in another parking lot down the street, not far from where I had encountered the creep. He asked me if that was the man that I had encountered, and it was hard to tell between the darkness and the distance, but I was pretty sure that it was. Another police vehicle had pulled into that parking lot, and it appeared that the officer got out to talk to the man. The officer that I had been talking to asked me how far I was away from my house, and I told him that I was pretty close to my street at this point. He assured me that I should be safe to walk the rest of the way home, and that they had other cops patrolling the area. I thanked him and finished walking home without further incident, thank God. Shortly after I got home, I saw that I had a text from my boyfriend that read, Are you okay? The text had been sent at around the same time the incident was occurring, as if he could sense that I was in a fearful situation. I replied back, telling him what had happened. He told me that he had gotten yelled at by a homeless man earlier too. I described the creep that I encountered to him and asked him if he thought that it was the same guy. He said he didn't think so. We also had a brief phone call to make sure that each other was okay. I let him know that I was home safe and he told me that he was in a vehicle with a group, so he was safe too. I don't know what the cops ended up doing about the man, but I hope that he stays 
as far away from me as possible. This happened seven and a half years ago, June 23rd, 2016, while I was out cleaning my house. I was renting a house for a year, and the year was almost up. I wasn't going to be living there the next year, so it was time for me to start cleaning out and moving my stuff to my next place. The house that I had at the time was fairly small, but it was plenty of space for just me. I lived there by myself, and I had just finished cleaning out the living room other than some basic furniture, and I had moved on to clean the kitchen. There were quite a few cabinets, so many that I didn't use a good number of them. I was looking through some of the ones that I didn't use to make sure that there was nothing I had in them. One of them I opened up and I saw something in the back corner. It looked like some type of shirt or rag. I grabbed it and saw that I didn't think that it was mine. But when I moved it, it revealed a small white lever that I could barely see. The cabinet was in the quarter, sorted by the sink and halfway blocked by the stove. I thought that it was just another pipe, but it just looked a little different to me. I got inside and had to crawl inside the cabinet, which was pretty large. Once I got inside, I saw that there was a small trap door to the side leading into the wall. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. You had to be completely inside in order to see the detail of it. And I decided to open the door, which led to an extremely narrow hallway with a sort of crawl space. But when I got farther inside, I was horrified. I saw that there was food, as well as several blankets, as if someone had been living inside of there. The good news, at least to me, is that whoever was in there was gone. I tried to make sense of it and figure out how long the person had been there and how I didn't know about it. I was gone from the house a lot with work and other stuff, but I didn't know how it was possible for someone to live in there without me knowing. I continued cleaning until it got pretty late, and the next day after work I continued. I was still kind of in shock with finding a secret room in my house and decided to look at it once again. I opened the cabinet and went inside, then I pulled the lever open just like I had the previous day. But this time, as soon as I opened it, I saw movement and then saw a person for a split second. They slammed the door shut back on me and I immediately turned and ran all the way out of my house to my car and then called the police. I was so scared that I started driving away as well. I opened up my phone, told the police the whole situation and they came to my house a short time later to find that whoever had been there was now gone. I was absolutely disgusted knowing that this random person had access to my house for who knows how long. It felt like a vivid nightmare that I needed to wake up from. When I opened up my phone to call the police, it showed that the date was June 23rd, 2016. I still remember this date seven years later. It stayed with me like a scar. I don't know if I will ever heal from it. Luckily for me, I moved out the next week. I really don't know how long the person was living in my secret room, but thankfully, they never gave me a problem. Thanks for reading my true horror story. As someone who has already experienced things like home invasion, I would always suggest that you lock your doors because you can never know what people can do when they are in your house. I'm a 31-year-old female, and I used to work at a restaurant in my early 20s as a hostess. Back then, I was a people pleaser and didn't have the backbone that I have now. During my shift, there was a man in the bar area, which can be seen from my stand, who eventually approached me. He was in his 50s, probably 6 foot 3 inches, muscular, large build, dark hair, and he dressed well. When he approached, it started out as small talk. I can't remember the beginning of the conversation, but then he started asking me if I had considered a different job 
and said that I should come work for him, but he wouldn't tell me what he does. He started asking me for my phone number. I didn't feel comfortable giving this stranger my personal information, so I told him that he could call the restaurant and ask for me. I'm there a lot. He didn't like that answer. He continued asking, and I gave him the same answer. Finally, I told him that I'd give him my email. I gave him a fake email address on a piece of paper, obviously. I made it look real, but I wasn't interested in continuing the conversation because he was being very pushy, so I excused myself to the back. I remained friendly and smiled during the entire exchange because that was my job. After avoiding him for a while, I saw him going back and forth from the bathroom, eyes darting around the restaurant, head turning around every which way. He was clearly looking for me, and I was actively avoiding him. I started to get scared, thinking maybe he was trying to kidnap or traffic me or something, which didn't feel like a stretch because of the way that our exchange went. I decided to tell my manager that he was making me uncomfortable and told them what happened. However, I forgot to mention that I gave him a fake email address. My manager approached him and asked him to leave because he was making staff uncomfortable. This man argued with my manager in front of the entire restaurant. He was saying he just wanted to have a conversation and that was it. He refused to leave. I was standing there during the entire argument and he pulls out the email address and says, if I'm making her uncomfortable, why did she give me her email address? And shoved it into our faces. Instead of explaining to him and my manager that it was a fake, I froze. I was angry and in complete disbelief of the situation. He eventually left, and my manager hated me after that. I left not long after, and to this day, that manager still doesn't know that the email was fake. I don't know why I never told her. I don't know why I froze. I don't know what that man wanted. I've thought a lot about it since then, and it was almost a decade ago. I'm glad that I didn't give him anything he wanted, but I wish that I could tell my younger self to stick to her guns and don't take stuff from anyone, especially a man who is using intimidation tactics to try and get what he wants, whatever that was. I was working at a small business in Iowa when a man came in for an interview. He was polite enough but didn't say much, but something just felt off. While my boss interviewed him, I stocked shelves, listening to the man answer our standard questions. What's your availability? Have you ever been arrested? Things like that. When he left, the manager asked me what I thought. There's something weird about him. I got really bad vibes. The boss kind of chuckled at me and said, we can't deny someone employment because of bad vibes. I took out my phone and Googled the guy's name. He had been arrested a few months prior for threatening to shoot up a gas station after being accused of theft. He lied and said that he had never been arrested. Is that a good enough reason to not hire someone? It was, and it may have saved my life. I remember September 2018, a beautiful clear day the calmness broken by the sound of police cars flying down the road. A student had been murdered in the middle of the day on a nearby golf course. She had passed a group of men who very shortly later found her things abandoned on the ground. Concerned, they called management and shortly after she was found, stabbed to death, her body floating in a pond. Everyone was in shock. This was the second murder of a young student Iowa had in just a few weeks. Was it a disgruntled golfer? A jealous lover? No. The young woman had simply been at the wrong place at the wrong time. She did not know her killer. He did not know her. He was a homeless man who was in the woods by a golf course, saw an opportunity and took it. He had a fantasy about R-wording and killing a woman. The next day, the story made headlines, and plastered on the front was the killer's face. My stomach turned when I saw him. He looked so familiar. I didn't recognize the name, 
But then again, I've never been good with names. But I remember stories. I googled his name. The same story about a man being arrested for threatening to shoot up a gas station came up, and instantly I knew who he was. It was the same man that I had convinced my boss not to hire. At the job, the majority of the shifts, there was only one or two of us working. I would have been alone with this guy at so many points. So many slow hours, with few customers, so many blind spots, so many opportunities to be alone with him. It only took a few minutes for a murder to occur on a beautiful day at a golf course. So yes, trust your instincts. Hello friends. So I came across some information about an old friend which has left me, as the kids say nowadays, shook. I figured I'd make a post to sort through my thoughts and share a rather insane story. But before we get started, my name is Mikey, and I'm in my 20s. Also, I'd like to apologize for how overly sarcastic this post may seem. Humor is my defense mechanism. Trigger warning. This story mentions murder, but I don't go into much detail. Stay safe out there, friends. When I was an angsty teenager, I moved in with my mother and stepdad to escape a less than desirable situation. Because of the move, I was enrolled in a new school. This school was located in one of the sketchiest neighborhoods in the city. Everyone who resided in that area was relatively low income, my family included. We had a rec center near the school that was a hot spot for, let's call them undesirables, which was primarily teenage boys wandering over from the nearby high school to catcall the girls. Lunchtime was my favorite. I loved going outside for chow and having sweaty teenage boys ask for the nasty. Note the sarcasm. Anyway, during my time at my crappy school, I made an array of friends. However, there was one person who became my best friend. Let's call her Blondie. She and I got along like... What's a negative connotation? I was a people pleaser, and she took advantage of that. Blondie was nice enough, but she was problematic. Regardless, we were fast friends and thus began our very short-lived friendship. Over the school year, she mainly came over to my house, since I was an only child. We usually had the house to ourselves while my folks were at work. However, she finally invited me to her house around the middle of the school year. I was super excited. I had always wanted to meet her family since they were such an enigma. Blondie wasn't one to divulge information about her home life. All I knew was that she lived with her mother, stepdad, and a younger sibling. I'm unsure if she was embarrassed or didn't care to share but I finally had the honor of meeting them. Honestly, her family was amazing. They were kind and treated me very well. Not to mention, her stepdad was a phenomenal cook. The best spaghetti and meatballs I've ever had. After that, I started going to her house more and more. And you know what? I really enjoyed it. Fast forward to a month or two before the end of the school year, and it's Blondie's birthday. Her family was throwing a little get-together at her house, and I was invited. Blondie and I headed over to her house after school, and it was really a fun time. Until near the end of the day. Now, I knew next to nothing about her biological father. I knew he wasn't really in the picture. He'd sometimes drop by and say hello, but I had never personally met him. This was until he had made a surprise visit to give Blondie a present. When I tell you there was a shift in the atmosphere, I kid you not. I could immediately feel it, and I was a dumb kid. We were inside the living room eating some cake, and there was a knock at the front door. Blondie's mom answered, and her face, which once had a smile, turned to a scowl. If looks could kill, the dude would be dead. She moved aside and this man walked in. 
I'll never forget how everyone in the room got tense except for Blondie, who excitedly greeted her dad. At the time, he seemed like a normal-ish dude. Maybe a tad bit on the creepier side, but who am I to judge? Blondie introduced me to her father, and we had shared some pleasantries. At one point, I was invited to get some ice cream with him the following day, which I accepted. I mean, I was getting free ice cream. Of course I was going to say yes. He eventually left, and we all got back to eating cake. I had honestly forgotten about the visceral reaction everyone had upon seeing him. Maybe if I remembered, I would have said no. Anyway, the following day rolled around, and I went for ice cream with Blondie and her dad. I can't remember much from that day other than him asking me if I had a boyfriend or girlfriend, which seems innocent enough. But the way that he asked me, it made me feel weird. I honestly can't remember much from my other encounters with this man. Nothing really jumps out to me. I know I went out with him and Blondie a few more times before my family moved to another city, and we lost touch. Fast forward a few years, and I'm attending college. I had managed to stay in contact with one person from my middle school days. Let's call her Teddy. She had reached out to me one day asking if I wanted to go to a movie, which I happily accepted. I was balls deep in the big sad at that time and needed to pick me up. A film with an old friend was just what I needed. I took the train to a nearby mall and Teddy and I watched the movie. After, we headed to the food court and got some chow. We were catching up. It had been a couple of years since we last saw each other. When Teddy suddenly perked up, she asked me if I heard about Blondie's father, to which I said we hadn't been in contact since I had moved. Teddy's face lit up, and she told me the most mind-blowing story that my little brain had ever heard. She informed me that Blondie's father had murdered a woman. Now before I continue, she was going based on word of mouth, while she was telling me all of the details. Teddy had no news articles or police reports to back her story. She was told by a friend who had heard from someone else and so on. But what she told me wasn't actually far from the truth. According to her, Blondie's father had taken the life of a street worker. He got away with it for two years and his truck got him caught. Apparently there was something unique about it. Teddy couldn't tell me much more because she genuinely didn't know. I remember going back to my dorm and trying to Google for more details, but I couldn't find a thing about it. I eventually forgot about the story until last year, 2023. I was discussing the craziest stories from my life with a friend when I suddenly remembered Teddy's story. After some digging, I finally found an article that described the crime. I clicked on it, and when I saw the picture of the man, well, words can't describe what I felt. Everything that Teddy told me was true, but it was so much worse than what she and I thought. Out of respect for the victim and her family, I won't describe what he did, but he was arrested three years after he had taken her life. I can't find any information about how he was caught, but it had something to do with his truck. He was charged with manslaughter. He took a plea bargain and indignity to a body and only served seven years of his 14-year sentence. He had served half already because he was in custody during the trial. I looked him up again not too long ago, and I learned some unsettling information which prompted me to write this post. He was released from prison a few months ago. Guess what he did? He killed another woman. From what I've read, it had similarities to the other murder that he committed. This time around, he's charged with second-degree murder and indignity to a body. There's, unfortunately, still not a lot of information about the second woman, but both of his victims were mothers. They were both cruelly taken from this world, and I can't wrap my mind around this at all. I met this monster. I was best friends with his daughter. I don't think that I was personally in any danger. But the fact that I met someone capable of such heinous crimes, it scares the living crap out of me. I can't even begin to imagine how Blondie must have felt after learning of her father's crimes. Anyway, I apologize for the length of the story and how vague I was regarding the crimes. I know that some of you really want to know everything, 
but it didn't feel right to share their story, especially since it had very little to do with me. I was just the schmuck that was friends with the daughter. Also, I would like to provide more information about how Blondie is, but I can't remember her last name for the life of me. She doesn't share the same one as her dad. But regardless, thank you for reading. I think someone just tried to kidnap me. I don't know what just happened. Seriously, I am freaked out and at a loss thinking I'm either psycho or overreacting. Or someone was legit trying to kidnap me or assault me. So I work pretty late most nights. And sometimes when I need something right away, I have no choice but to go to this store. That's the only one open late after work. Fast forward. I was driving home and noticed a car behind me super close with their lights bright as crap. I thought that it was a cop, but made a turn, and no, it was a small black sedan. Okay, weird. So I kept going my usual route, and start noticing this car flashing their brights behind me over and over and over, while following me my whole route home. I know I didn't drop anything, because all I brought in the store was my keys and phone for Apple Pay. My trunk wasn't open. I was seriously getting weirded out, so I made a fast turn and started going 60 on this back road. I didn't even care about cops. I actually wanted to get pulled over. Well, this dude was right there behind me going 60 as well, still flashing his high beams. Finally, after about 10 minutes of this, there were these cops in the road doing construction, directing traffic. Then I looked back and he turned off right away. What just happened? Leaving my friend's house, I accidentally backed into a brick mailbox. My bike rack hit the mailbox, so my car was okay, but completely demolished the mailbox. No big deal, right? That's why we have insurance, right? I went to the neighbor and told him what happened, and gave them my insurance, phone number, and name. All I got was his first name. From the get-go, this dude was creepy. He kept hitting on me, trying to date me, specifically trying to feed me. I left on my drive to my mom's. I'm attending out-of-state college and my parents are divorced. The guy that I backed into, Robert, began to text me and call me. He was insistent that it was better for both of us to just pay out of pocket for the mailbox, sending me links to his companies that could fix it for $500, and demanding that I go on a date with him so that I could give him the cash for the repair and he could feed me. I don't know what his deal with the food was. I declined everything but started to get annoyed by his constant texts and calls. Finally, after two days of it with my responses being only, please contact my insurance, I sent him a text saying that he was harassing me. I blocked him, but he made a new number and threatened to report it as a hit and run to the police. I'm in law school, okay? This wasn't a hit and run. I blocked the second number. Then he used a new number to ask me if I wanted him to send a screenshot or video of the accident to his insurance. I admit this made me angry. I called this number and dug my nail so hard into my thigh that I drew blood as he threatened reporting things, asking me on a date, and trying to entice me to just pay cash. I finally screamed, Don't you contact me again, you piece of crap. My dad heard me and was upset that I said that to someone that I was in an accident with and that I said that to a guy who thought that I was cute and just wanted a date. I blocked the third number. The next day, he reaches out again to tell me that I gave him the wrong policy number. I told him I didn't. He then said it'd be easier to pay cash, that I was the problem, etc. He was talking to his insurance, I guess, and began trying to validate my info. He had my mom's name, address, and phone number. 
I verified it, told him to not contact me again, and blocked his new number. The next morning, I got a super early text, basically saying that he finished the claim and I was awful for making it harder than it needed to be by going through insurance and not going on a date with him. He then included, You're so beautiful and ugly at the same time. Don't take risks. Stay on the good path. Goodbye. At this point, I got scared. Fifth number block. Then at midnight, he texts, You up? I know where you live. Don't try and screw me over on insurance. I'll report it as a hit and run. You should have just gone on a date with me. I took the phone to my dad, showed him the texts, and filled him in. My dad, a pretty scary dude, then calls the guy. He answered, Shoot, I knew you were into me. Want to come over? My dad got very mad. My dad said this was beyond harassment. This was his final warning to not contact me. That we didn't care how he reported it, etc. Robert began saying that I came onto him and offered my body as a payment, invited in my house, and was a horny B word. Instantly blocked, police contacted, insurance notified, all the things. Next day, I talked to insurance, protective order filed. I get another text telling me that I shouldn't have involved police. Blocked seventh number. Notify police. Go to stay at my dad's because dude doesn't have this address. My dad is a very tall, scary dude who loves his Second Amendment. Last night, watching Star Wars with my dad and older brother, the doorbell rings. Dad goes to see who it is. And it's Robert with a trash bag filled with things that I left at his house. I call the police. My dad goes ballistic. All the things. Police come and arrest the guy. Then the bag, lingerie, a knife, lip balm, and a Dita Von Tess fetish book. I met with my attorney. Plot twist, the guy doesn't own the house. He's an illegal immigrant, is married, and is being deported. I feel awful that he's being deported. I genuinely think that he wanted to R-word and or kill me. I go back to school in a few days and I'm terrified that he or someone else will follow me. Also, I've kept my friend, his neighbor, informed through the whole process. He hasn't reached out to her, except for a video of me backing into the mailbox. I don't know if any legal immigrant can be charged with crimes, but he was arrested for stalking, trespassing, felony assault. He tried to push my dad and then spat at him. Insurance fraud. He lied about the accident to his insurance agent. Possession of a deadly weapon with intent. The knife in the bag. And attempted breaking and entering. They just kept adding on the charges. Every time that he would do something new. I'm an 18-year-old female who used to live in Las Vegas before I moved recently. And if you don't already know, Las Vegas is number two on the sex trafficking list. I used to go out a lot to a late night 7-Eleven and get snacks because I was bored and wasn't tired. The one closer to my home I got banned from, so I had to go to one a bit further away. I used to go by myself, and the walk there was creepy. Most of the streetlights don't work and it's just dark and really creepy. This time, I ended up getting ice cream and some kind of candy. Anyways, on my way back, I'm about to get to the crosswalk to get to the side my house was on when I noticed a guy standing outside one of the other apartment's complex. He wasn't there before, but some of the apartments are facing the street that I walk on. He started yelling something, but I wasn't sure that if he was talking to me or not because I was on the phone with my boyfriend. I crossed the street and walked past him. Something felt off when I crossed the street and walked past him, he didn't say a word. The only time he had said anything was when I was across the street. Maybe he noticed I was on the phone. I kept walking and glancing behind me, nothing too obvious, and then he started yelling and walking faster. That time I knew that he was talking to me and knew that he was following me. I told my boyfriend, 
and he said just walk fast home and try to get home. Also, this guy was pimped out, like dressed like he was a pimp. Gold chains, expensive shoes and clothes, etc. And I say this because I didn't live in a great neighborhood, and you wouldn't see people dressed like that. Anyways, I noticed that he was speeding up every time I looked behind me. I started panicking because I was genuinely scared that something was going to happen. But another guy passes me. We say hello like casual, and the guy that was following me runs across the street. I was like, this dude just probably saved my life because he said hi to me. I also didn't know who he was at all. I got home safe, but I'll never get ice cream at night alone again. I'll try my best to recall this story that just popped into my memory randomly. This would have been in the late 90s in Connecticut. Maybe about 1998. I was a teenager, and some of my friends had started getting driver's licenses. So we did what any teen in the 90s did. Drive around with our friends looking for something to do in a small town. There were about five of us in a friend's car. I wasn't driving. I was on the passenger side in the back seat. We were riding around, listening to music, talking. No substances were used. We were on a wooded, windy road at night. Suddenly, the driver slammed on her brakes, and we watched as this creature crossed in front of us. Illuminated by the headlights, the creature was about toddler height, very, very pale, no clothing, bald, and very slender. It paused briefly to look at us. I remember we all got dead silent. It passed the road quickly and went into the woods. It walked on two legs. It was most certainly not an animal that I'd ever seen, especially since it was bipedal, and it definitely wasn't a kid. The only thing I can't recall is its face. I did see the creature, but from my side in the car, my view was slightly obstructed. We were all silent for a few moments, processing what we'd seen. I remember another passenger whispered, Dude, what the heck? We continued on in silence with the occasional, Did you see that thing? We kept the radio off at that point, and the driver started bringing us all to our homes. We were so creeped out, we didn't feel like having fun anymore. One of our friends, nicknamed El Chalupa, so occasionally we'd bring it up. I've lost touch with all of them at this point. I'm in my 40s now, but we never did find out what we saw. This was before most of us even had home computers, let alone a cell phone or Google. Any idea? When I was young, probably under 10, I was on a horseback ride with my parents. We were all riding our own horses. My horse at the time was always the lead. We were going up a slight incline in some wooded trails. I remember feeling my horse stop as if she was startled. I looked to my right, and between the trees stood a male figure. I don't remember a lot, but he was green in appearance as if he was covered in moss. He had a white tight t-shirt on. He was rather muscular, but no larger than the average man. It has stopped mid-stride and stared back at me. I looked back to see my parents and if they were seeing what I was seeing. And when I looked back, it was gone. To this day, it still gives me the chills. I always wanted to know the significance. This happened around 2012 or 2013. Me and my friend, ages 13 and 14 respectively, 
We're out exploring a patch of woods at the edge of my hometown in northern Minnesota. We went in a bit deeper than we usually did and spotted a well-built tarp shelter. Being the tactical tweens we were, we snuck up to it from different sides with a BB gun and a knife and called out, to which there was no reply. We went inside and found some clean tin cookware and utensils on a little handmade counter slash shelf. We came back the next day and the shelter was destroyed. The tarps cut up and there were stab marks in the cookware. I still wonder to this day whose shelter it was and why it was destroyed like that. I'm a former Brazilian Marine, eight years of active duty, and I'd like to report a well-known story among the Marines about the disappearance of a sergeant on an island where we usually conduct military training once a year, known as Ilha da Marambia. The Ilha of Marambaya, Marambaya Island, is an island that during the time when Brazil was still an empire, was refuge of slaves who fled the farms and gathered in communities in the most isolated parts of the island. These people are known as Quilombolas, and to this day, they still survive on the island through hunting and fishing. At one of these military trainings that takes place every year, a newly graduated sergeant, I don't know his name, but let's call him Ricardo to make it easier to tell the story, made friends with one of the Quilambalas who live there in the region, which is very rare to happen, as we are advised to avoid any contact with them as they are known to be hostile to the military man. During some conversations with the Quilambola, he told Sergeant Ricardo about an ancient story of an old treasure hidden inside a cave in one of the isolated areas of the island. This old treasure that was hidden there by a group of thieves who shipwrecked on the island many years ago, during the time when Brazil was still an empire. However, he told Sergeant Ricardo that he should not enter the cave because any Quilombola that had already entered into it never returned again, so it was known to be inhabited by a spirit who protected the treasure from outsiders. Ricardo was skeptical and did not believe much in spirits. So he asked for the Quilambala to show him where the cave was. The same refused to show the cave entrance, because he said that it was very dangerous. Ricardo then did not insist, and decided to forget that story and just focus on the military training. Years passed, and Ricardo never forgot the story of the treasure on the island, and he was thinking about how his life would be changed if he managed to find that treasure. The life of a marine in Brazil was very rough, and the salary was very low. So he dreamed of getting out of the Marine Corps, and starting his own business, and that treasure could help him with that. So he decided that the next time that he went to attend a military training on the Marambaya Island, he would insist that the Quilambala show him where the cave entrance is, even if for that he had to offer him money to show him the way. So after a few months, Sergeant Ricardo became aware that he would be chosen to be part of the next training on the island. So that would be his chance to change his life, and he would not let that escape. Arriving on the island, he attended the usual training drills and waited until the day off, which was one of the days when there would be no training, and he would have more time to explore the cave. He waited for dawn to go to the Quilambala's place without anyone from his squad seeing him, since the exploration of the island by the military was prohibited by the officers, as there have been cases of military disappearing in previous training. And then he asked one of the Quilambalas to show him the way to the cave. Before he went to the Quilambala, Ricardo invited a close friend to go with him to help him find the treasure. This close friend is the person who spread the story that you are reading and said that if they found the treasure, he would share the treasure with him. The sergeant's friend refused to go because he said it was very dangerous 
and advised him to not go there either. He ignored his friend's advice and decided to go there anyway. After finding one of the Quilambalas and insisting that it showed him the way, he agreed and took Ricardo to the entrance of the cave, where the sergeant entered in search of the treasure that could change his life. The next day, the sergeant's friend noticed that he had not returned from his search in the cave and told the officers what had happened. Search teams were requested, and it took about a week to find the entrance to the cave where the sergeant entered. After conducting searches inside the cave, they found the Sergeant Ricardo's dead body. Probably he was lost inside and could not find the exit or was bit by a snake. Heavy rain on that island is very common, and normally snakes take refuge inside of the caves. It's said that the Marine Corps compensated the sergeant's family and hid the case from the public so that it did not appear in the newspapers. I don't know if that really happened or not, but it's a very common story in the Marine Corps that is often told by older Marines. It's said that this story happened in the early 1990s, so I think at the time it was not very difficult to hide this kind of story from the media. This happened last night, and I'm still pretty freaked out. We're up at my father-in-law's for Christmas. He lives in South Jersey, in a pretty remote area just north of Burn State Forest. It's quiet, and always a little eerie, but felt especially weird with the overcast weather and unseasonable warmth of the last few days. We did Christmas dinner at my brother-in-law's and got back pretty late. Because of the radiator heat and outside temps, we slept with the window open. I woke up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, and as I was drifting back to sleep, I heard a low wail, building in volume for a few seconds before stopping abruptly. I figured it was just an odd-sounding bird and tried to go back to sleep. It happened twice more over the course of maybe five minutes. I was basically able to put it out of my head and start drifting back to sleep when I heard a loud, shrill blast, like a too high elephant's trumpet. At that point, I shot up, heart racing. I knew I had to close the window and took a beat to build up to it. When I dragged myself out of bed, I peeked through the shutters before I reached to shut the pane. Whatever it was had tripped the motion sensor light at the back of the property and was half illuminated, standing maybe a hundred feet from the back door, right at the tree line. It was cloaked, with its head partially shrouded. The bottom of its face looked flat and round like the back of a dinner plate, with another smaller, half-uncovered black circle at its center. I immediately slammed the window shut and it didn't move, just stood there with its face tilted towards the window. I shut the blinds and crept into bed, and basically hid until the sun came up. I didn't hear any more sounds. I dared another look out the window after dawn, and the figure was gone, and I managed to drift back to sleep for a few hours. Has anyone seen anything like this, or know what it might be? I'm frantically googling, but nothing is really coming up. So to give you a little bit of background information on this story, which is 100% true, I would like to start with the fact that I am European. I posted another story a couple of months back about something that happened to me in Tuscany, Italy. As for me and my friends in this story, we are from Spain, and when this happened at the end of September of 2023, we were fairly new to the USA. I moved here a while back for law school, and so did my friends. We had been living there for a few months and decided to explore the nature of this beautiful continent as we all live in New York City. So, long story short, we decided to go on a road trip to Canada, drive around Lake Ontario and then drive back to New York City through upstate New York. I'm a male and my friends were three females. 
For the sake of anonymity, let's call them Lisa, Anne, and Charlotte. Everything went super smooth until last night. So for our last night, we had rented an off-grid cabin in a remote area in the woods in upstate New York. To give some locals an idea, we were like half an hour drive from Harrisburg, I think. Me and Lisa had decided to spend one night in this cabin because it was one with nature. The cabin was super old, made from log wood, and there was no running water or electricity. Both me and Lisa had experience with survival in the wild in Europe. I, for myself, had been a boy scout my whole life and even was a scout leader for a while. Our other two friends were, as much as I love them, purebred city girls. They had pretty much zero experience with camping, or to just be in a place where there is no service for the phones, as was the case in this cabin. We had been driving all day to get there, and when we reached the beginning of the forest, it was already past 10 p.m., and it was really dark that night. While driving to this place, we lost internet connection with the GPS, so I had to drive to the cabin on intuition, paired with a good old-fashioned map hoping for the best, while trying to drive safe on these muddy trails. It was also rainy the whole day. On the way there, Anna and Charlotte were in the back of the car, and the moment they lost phone service, they got pretty uneasy for the rest of the ride. All of a sudden, in the pitch black darkness of the forest, we all saw a campfire, but there were no houses around, or people, just a campfire a well-organized one since the fire was not spreading, and it was not as big as a bonfire. It kind of startled all of us, as this was a little bit weird, since there was no one around and we were really deep in the forest already. Plus, it was getting very late. When this happened, we also reached the end of the trail, and we figured we had taken the wrong trail at a crossroad before. So I turned around and we were on our way again. Half an hour later, and a couple of wrong trails later, we finally had arrived at our destination, as we could finally see the first glimpse of this godforsaken cabin in the middle of nowhere. To give you an idea of how old it was, the outhouse was made of wood and was outside of the cabin. When we arrived, it was still raining, and both Anne and Lisa were definitely not in the mood for getting out of the car and getting in the cabin with zero lights. So me and Lisa left the lights on at the car, and we went inside the cabin while also using our phone flashlight to check the cabin out and see if we could find any old flashlights, which we did, and to see if we could turn on the fireplace, which we didn't, because all of the wood was still wet from the rain, and it seemed that no one had prepared dry wood anywhere. So with a couple of old flashlights and a small improvised fire that I managed to make in the stove, we all four got in the cabin and started to make some pasta for ourselves. Meanwhile, the girls were preparing the beds and closing the windows since it was already cold in this part of the state. The cabin had a small ladder which led to an elevated room slash space with a bed where all three of the girls could fit in and I would sleep downstairs in a bunk bed that seemed older than the First World War. While making pasta, Anna, one of the city girls, came up to me, and knowing that both Lisa and Charlotte did not like to hear anything scary at night, told me that she had seen an old cemetery in the middle of the forest on the way to our cabin, and that she had seen a figure walk around there. I first laugh it off as nothing, as I mentioned in my previous story, I do not consider myself a big believer of scary stuff. Being from Spain, we take promises very seriously. To swear to God is very serious for us and she swore to God that she was not lying. I told her then that I believed her, but that there was no need to panic, as I would lock all the doors when we would go to sleep. We had some pasta, managed to make a couple of s'mores, which were lovely by the way, and drank a couple of beers, or at least I did. They all had just one. I can assure you that I am not drunk after just a couple of beers, and that I would never start to hallucinate. Just saying that, in case anyone thinks that I saw stuff because of the beer. They all three went to sleep pretty early after finishing the s'mores and their beer, 
And I, considering that I really love the outdoors and that I don't really mind a little bit of rain, decided to take my last beer and a flashlight outside to the front porch, also very old and made of wood, and sat myself down with my beer while enjoying the sound of the rain and the lovely sight of not seeing a single light in the distance. I could greatly appreciate this coming from New York City, and I just scanned the area around with my flashlight. There was nothing much really to see, besides a lot of trees and a small creek a little bit further away. All I could hear was the wind, the rain, and the running water down in the creek. That was until I suddenly heard what I would describe as a weird roar. The first thing that came to my mind was a bear, but I had researched well before our trip, and I knew that bears were not common at all in this part of the state. I also know what a bear roar would sound like, and it did not resemble it a lot, except from the fact that it was a deep war, if you get what I mean. Startled but not really scared, I continued to scan the rest of the forest for as far as I could see from the porch. It was then when my eyes caught the glimpse of a figure, well hidden deep into a tree line. I would describe the figure as tall. For a reference, I'm six foot four, and I thought that this thing was at least a foot or two higher than me. It was well hidden because with its brown fur, that is what I think it was at least, or the skin in any case, blended in well with the trees in autumn. It was definitely aware of our presence as I saw two eyes glimpsing into my flashlight. I could not tell you what it was, but I swear to God that it was not a bear. It was bipedal and had rather long arms, I would say. We looked at each other for what seemed like an eternity, but in reality, it was more like five seconds before it vanished behind a tree and I heard another roar. It was then when I felt all the hair stand up and I was definitely very much scared. I went inside as quick as I could and locked all the doors and closed all the curtains. I quickly went to bed and tried to wave it off as just my exhaustion of driving all day playing tricks on my mind. But I promise you, this was very real. After an hour or so, I had calmed down and finally fell asleep. The rest of the night was uneventful, and the next morning when I went to relieve myself after having drank beer the night before, the weather had cleared and it was rather sunny. And as far as I could see, the forest was calm and beautiful. No sight of any animals or anything abnormal. We had a nice breakfast that morning and left for our way back to the city that never sleeps. And so also ends my story of that night. I never talked about what I saw that night because I know all three girls did not like to hear scary stories. And I figured after these months that this was the best place to share it. If anyone has an idea of what it could have been, please feel free to enlighten me, especially if it is backed up with rational reasoning. Hi everyone. I've debated posting this for a long time, but never got around to it, mainly because I try to keep calm and keep this memory out of my brain. This might be a long one, but this is a creepy thing that happened to me about four years ago. For starters, I grew up in Southwest Saskatchewan and moved onto my aunt's farm in 2019 to live in the other house that is on their property. The house is fairly old, but I loved it. It wasn't long after I moved in, though, that I started to feel uneasy in the house alone. I would close every window when it got dark, as it felt like something was watching me through them every night. Eventually, I decided to get a puppy to keep myself company when my boyfriend at the time was at work or away from the house. It helped to have the company, but I always dreaded having to take her outside when it was dark. For a bit of scene setting, our house sat on the left side of the gravel road. At the back of the house, there was about 10 meters of backyard. And then there was a cow pasture in the cow barn. We didn't own cows, but in the summer, another farmer would rent our pasture space 
and we would have them on the property. It wasn't uncommon at night to hear coyotes surround the farm either, and there were tons. Every so often when I'd go out with my puppy, we'd hear them all around us, too close for comfort. We had a farm dog too, who would keep the coyotes away for the most part, as she was huge. But every so often, she'd wander elsewhere on the property to scout, and the coyotes would get a little too close for comfort. They always tried to lure my puppy out to them, but luckily I kept her leashed. Now, one thing you should know about my pup is that it takes her forever to find a spot to go potty. This is still a problem today four years later, but back then, it was the bane of my existence. She would pace for at least five minutes, and that was only after finding a suitable spot. Sometimes we would be out there for almost a half an hour, just so that she would go and not go in the house. Another problem of hers. Huskies, am I right? On this particular night, it was raining pretty heavily. I was not happy to be out there, and she had decided that she wasn't going to go until she found her perfect spot. We had already been out there for 15 minutes, and at this point she was also getting frustrated with the rain and wanted to go inside. But I wanted her to go before we went in, since we'd already been out there for so long. So, as any annoyed puppy mother would do, I started getting a little frustrated and would repeat, go, go potty, every time she'd get distracted from her objective. It was dark. I was cold and annoyed. And to make matters worse, the cows behind us were fussing fairly loudly. This was out of the ordinary for them. They were usually quiet and sleeping at this time of night. I was also hearing what sounded like a strange bird whistling, but shook it off as probably being an owl. I tried to keep it off my mind as I kept shouting and pleading go through the rain to my small, fuzzy, white dog. I was facing away from the pasture, and suddenly, in my left ear, I heard it. Go. Now, one thing you should know about me is I have a very strong flight response typically, but this froze me on the spot as I was mostly confused at what the heck I had just heard. I tried telling myself that I didn't hear it. I tried telling myself that it was just a moo from a cow that I had heard wrong. But again, as if spoken directly behind me, I heard it again. Go. Go. It sounded unnatural. It was as if it came from someone who had never spoken a word before. A raspy, deep, monotone, go. It almost sounded like it was coming out of an old radio. But of course, there were no radios out there. Every time it said it, it sounded the exact same as the first time it was said. And whatever it was had started repeating it as if it had been taught its new favorite word. At this point, I spun around to the pasture to find nothing there. Then again from behind me, go. This had all happened in the span of about three seconds. And at this point, I remember shouting out loud, all right, don't have to tell me twice, as I picked up my little fur ball and made a mad dash for my front door. I swiftly locked both doors behind me and sat bewildered in my kitchen. The puppy went back to puppying immediately obviously unbothered by it all and happy mom wasn't making her stay out in the rain any longer i picked up my phone and called my aunt asking her if my uncle had been out in the field with the cows she said no and i explained to her what had just happened to me she sent my uncle over to the pasture to check it out but soon after told me that he hadn't seen or heard anything he said he'd check the pasture again in the morning I spent my night hiding from the windows, with the lights and TV on loud enough to not hear anything outside. The next morning when my uncle checked the pasture, he found two calves dead, explains the colossal cow panic that had ensued the night before. I regret this, but I didn't push for more information, as I honestly just didn't want to know. But they told me other than that, they didn't find anything out of the ordinary. 
a few months later, I moved off the farm. I couldn't be in that house alone anymore, and my boyfriend and I had parted ways. A few months after that, I started to go to therapy for the paranoia that this had caused me. I started feeling like people were watching me, out to get me. Another few months after that, I moved out of the province for good and finally felt safe. I'm wondering if any of you here have any idea what the heck this could have been. There's no chance there would have been someone in our field, as we were fairly far away from town and neighbors, and we have cameras that would have seen anyone enter our property. Coyotes are common, but I don't think that they are capable of mimicking words. Any ideas? In many rural areas of the American West, cutting firewood in national forests is a necessary chore if you want a warm house through the winter. Our home in mountainous central Idaho was no exception. It was normal for my dad to pick me and my brothers up after school and head into the mountains for an afternoon of firewood gathering. My dad would fell the dead trees, then saw them into chunks. My brothers and I had the task of rolling the wood to the truck and loading it. We would continue this assembly line process until we had a truckload of wood, usually before nightfall. Hot, sweaty, and exhausted, we would pile into the truck cab and make our way down the mountain. At home the next day, we would unload and split the wood and stack it into neat little rows. This process was repeated until we had a winter's worth of fuel for our house, our grandma's cabin, and any extra for elderly neighbors. This particular afternoon, we decided to try a different logging road on the other side of the valley. This was well outside our familiar logging area. No real reason for the change, but my dad said he wanted a change of scenery. This logging road hadn't been maintenanced in some time. Large rocks and fallen branches littered the path. My brothers and I had to walk out in front, pushing rocks and wood out of the way as my dad lurched the truck up the switchbacks. Yard by yard, we slowly made our way up the mountain. That hike was physically brutal. As we ascended the mountain and got farther into TBE trees, this odd feeling started to set in. I wasn't sure if it was the exhaustion from the hike or something more. There was electricity in the air, like the whole mountain was buzzing at a wavelength just below my senses. In some odd way, it felt like the mountain knew we were there, and it wasn't welcome to that fact. I wanted to say something to my brothers, but before I opened my mouth, my younger brother said, Does anyone else feel like we're not welcome here? My older brother and I stopped in our tracks and looked back at him. Both of us nodded in agreement. This moment was broken by my dad honking and motioning us to continue clearing the path. Reluctantly, we pushed forward to a small clearing in the woods, where we finally stopped the truck. My dad, oblivious to our apprehension, or simply choosing to ignore it, grabbed his saw and went to work. As the wood was felled and loaded, I couldn't shake this ominous feeling enveloping me like a dark shroud. I noticed my brothers were taking occasional glances over their shoulders as we worked. Everyone but my dad, it seemed, was on edge. The sun nestled down into the trees and twilight began to set in. As the light drained from the sky, my anxiety only intensified. It wasn't until my dad unexpectedly told us to load up that a wave of relief flooded over me. I could see the tension in my brothers melt away as well. The truck wasn't fully loaded, an oddity. Getting a half load was a waste, according to my dad. We would sometimes work into the dark just to make sure the truck was full. But tonight, he seemed eager to head home. With everything loaded, we started down the road. Although dead tired, everyone seemed to be in a much lighter mood. We were chatting and cracking jokes while trying to blow off steam from the afternoon. We were almost out of the tree line and into the valley desert. Going down the switchbacks, you want to be careful, especially with a load, even if it was half that. A brown blur jumped up from the downslope side of the switchback. Shit was the only word that came out of my dad's mouth as he slammed on the brakes. 
Loaded with wood and traveling downhill, there was no way to avoid smashing into the blur. The truck finally ground to a standstill. The four of us peered through the windshield. Nobody saying a word. Illuminated in the yellow glow of our headlights was a crumpled body of deer. Grumbling and cursing the deer's existence, my dad exited the truck to investigate. Doing as they were told, my brothers stayed put in the truck. I didn't listen, following close behind my dad. The truck was fine. We hadn't been traveling fast when we smacked the deer. Just some hair and blood in the grill guard. Hitting a deer really wasn't that unusual. The mountains were full of them. What was unusual was that the deer dropped so quickly. At faster speeds, deer could still be upright and sprinting away to die in the woods after a collision. That last burst of an adrenaline dump. This one fell over like a rag doll. Before even approaching the carcass, a deep, foul smell hit us. Deer smell bad when they're alive, but this was on a whole other level. It was the smell of decay and rot. My stomach began to turn as we got closer. My nostrils were burning. Coming up on the deer, it was clearly dead. Really, really dead. The stench was so overwhelming my eyes were watering. The body was a true horror scene. The deer's eyes were gone, replaced with sunken hollow hole. As if to overcompensate for their absence, the tunge was swollen and black as coal. It could not be contained and hung out the side of its mouth. The underbelly was split open. Entrails and offal spilled into the dirt. In the dim headlights, it looked as though the deer's fur and viscera were moving, wiggling almost. Holding my breath, I bent down for a closer look, and my heart stopped. The deer, inside and out, was covered in maggots. It was dead all right, but our truck didn't kill it. Clearly, it had been dead for days, if not weeks. I backed away, retching. That electric anxiety came screaming back. My dad was always the quiet, stoic type. But right now, even in the dim headlights of the truck, I could see the abject horror in his face. His gaze wasn't on the deer, but focused down the mountain. Poorly masking the fear in his voice, he told me firmly to walk back to the truck and get inside. I obeyed without objection. As I grabbed the door handle, a loud shriek came out of the trees. Branches were shattering and breaking. Something was heading up the slope towards us. I slammed my door closed just as my dad reached the truck. Before his door was shut, he pressed on the accelerator. The truck launched forward, sending us over the deer carcass and racing downhill. With mine and my brothers yelling, it was hard to tell if the shrieking was following us. Our truck popped out of the tree line and into the desert sagebrush. Once out of the woods, everything quieted down. We were left with only the rumble of the engine and wind through the half-opened windows. Pulling into our property, the truck came to a stop. We sat in silence. No one moved to leave the truck. Everyone started talking at once. We all had questions. What was the screaming? How does a dead deer jump uphill in front of a truck? There was no way the truck killed it. Dad just shook his head and motioned for us to quiet down. That deer was dead when we hit it. It didn't jump out in front of us. It was thrown at us. We stared at him. Ah. He explained that all day up on the mountain he had felt uneasy. Not wanting to worry us boys, he kept it to himself. He described it like walking into a stranger's living room while they were upstairs asleep. That feeling never left him. And as twilight came, he happened to catch a shadow in the corner of his eye. Not far into the woods and saw figures moving from tree to tree. He couldn't focus on them long enough for a good look before they dodged behind trees. His stomach dropped. Working hard to keep his composure, he hurried us to the truck to leave. It was after hitting the deer and discovering it was long dead that my dad pieced together what was happening. Something threw that deer to get us to stop. Before the shrieking began, he could hear something moving in the darkness beyond the road. It was a trap. Running back to the truck could have started an ambush or triggered a prey drive. So we walked back to the truck. The second we were inside, he drove that truck downhill with no intention of stopping for anyone or anything. That feeling of electricity didn't disappear until we hit the county highway. 
My brothers and I never saw anything as we drove away, but those screams from the forest will never leave my mind. We didn't gather firewood the rest of the season. For the first time in his life, my dad just bought what we needed. And although we started to gather wood again the next season, we've never been back up that particular mountain. The Forest Service has permanently closed and reclaimed that road. The only way back up into those woods is a long hike, one I'm not interested in ever taking again. Whatever was on that mountain, whatever threw that deer carcass, whatever chased us out of the woods, it did not want us there. It wanted us gone, or worse, it wanted us dead. This story happened just this summer. I'm only now getting around to writing it down. I would consider myself an outdoorsman. I grew up in the sticks. I've spent a lot of my life wandering in and enjoying the backcountry. I'm older now and have settled down in the suburbs. Wife, two boys, a house, a dog, a desk job, the whole suburban shtick. I want opportunities for my kids that come from suburban life but I also want them to grow up with an appreciation for the outdoors. So when my oldest son was big enough for his first solo father-son camping trip, I was excited. My wife and younger son stayed home for this midsummer trip. It was going to be a great bonding experience for me and my son. Because my son is just five, I didn't want to do anything too extreme on our first big solo camping trip. We needed a place that wasn't too deep into the Colorado Front Range but still allowed for dispersed camping. I don't consider camping in RV parks or established campgrounds to be actual camping. You might as well be at a motel watching TV. Camping at most is a tent, sleeping bag, and a fire. A dispersed camping area called Gordon Gulch, west of Boulder, caught my attention. I had never been to this area before. There were no facilities and it was dispersed enough you couldn't see or hear other campers nearby. My son and I had a blast that day. We set up camp, collected firewood, went for a hike, saw a moose and a bobcat, tried a little fishing, and finally, as the sunlight faded, we returned to our campsite to light a fire. We had a traditional and nutritious camping meal of fire-burned hot dogs and marshmallows. It was a good day. Definitely a core memory for both my son and me. The perfect first camping experience for a preschooler. Or so I thought. After all that fun, my son and I were exhausted. It was time for bed. The sound of an evening summer breeze through the pines is better than any commercial sleep aid. I don't even remember drifting off. It was a hard, dreamless sleep that only physical exertion can bring. One thing about my son, he inherited many things from me, hair color, eye shape, disposition, and my unusually wide feet. But one peculiar thing he got from his mother was sleep talking. It's not unusual to hear him having full conversations in his sleep. It gets more pronounced when he's overly tired. I was catapulted out of the void of sleep. Not sure what aroused me, I sat up collecting myself. The world seemed to be at peace. It was quiet, just me and the breeze through the treetops. I couldn't figure out what woke me so suddenly. The sound of my son laughing in his sleep cut through my groggy confusion. It was a deep belly laugh. Must be a fun dream, I thought hazily. Gently rocking him was enough to quiet him down. That must have been what startled me, I determined. As I repositioned to fall back to sleep, my son burst out laughing. I sighed and closed my eyes. He'll quiet down soon enough, I thought. He laughed again. This time, his laugh was echoed by something outside our tent. I held my breath and listened, unsure of what I just heard. It wasn't an echo. There was something out there, and it was laughing in unison with my son. My grogginess vanished as the adrenaline began to pump. It couldn't be real. It had to be my imagination. I sat up in my sleeping bag listening to the night. Hearing nothing after a minute, my muscles relaxed. I started to settle back down. 
must have been hearing things. I was tired after all. Checking the time I saw it was four in the morning. The sun would be up in a couple hours. My son laughed again, and again it was answered with laughter outside. I was now absolutely certain it was not an echo. As I tried to make sense of what was happening, the voice outside called out my son's name. My blood ran cold. That voice. It was so familiar. Then it clicked in my brain. It was the voice of my younger son. That wasn't at all possible. He was safe at home with my wife, miles and miles away. I could hear twigs crunching beyond our thin nylon tent walls. It was impossible to tell the distance from us. But there was something out there, circling us. Unprompted this time, it called out my son's name in that little toddler voice. My five-year-old, still fast asleep, called out to his brother, asking him to play. The thing outside the tent laughed in reply and urged my son to come outside. That thing with my little son's voice sounded cold, hollow, dead. The floodgates of my adrenaline burst open. Cold sweat formed on my face. I was frightened out of my mind, but my primal caveman brain roared to life. I was in Papa Bear mode. Nothing was going to take or hurt my son. I was putting a stop to this. Whatever it was out there, I didn't care. You don't mess with my kids. Say what you will. But when you're camping miles from anything, it's not worth the risk of being unarmed. Wild animals, wild people, you have to be prepared. I almost always take a firearm with me when I'm camping. Pepper spray and bear bells are great, but nothing gets attention from a conscious threat faster than the sound of chambering around. I spoke loudly into the night that I had a gun and was coming out. I hoped the fear in my voice was masked by my aggressiveness. The only reply was the breeze through the treetops. My son was still asleep. Kid's a hard sleeper. Another trait from his mom. My wife and I have joked that he could sleep through a tornado. Stepping out into the cool summer night, a gun in one hand and a flashlight in the other, I surveyed the campsite. The fire was down to embers. Our fishing gear was leaning against the pickup. The firewood was still neatly stacked. Nothing seemed out of place. Not wanting to stray far from the tent or my sleeping son, I sat down outside the entrance. I waited in the dark with the flashlight off. Not far into the trees, I heard a branch break. Then another snapped, this time closer. I stood up and flashed my light in the direction of the sound. Nothing was there. The voice called out, this time from behind, and this time focused towards me. Daddy, Daddy. It was my youngest son's voice again, crying out for me from the dark forest. I threw the light beam in that direction. A pair of shimmering green eyes were illuminated by my flashlight. They were only two or so feet above the ground, the same height as a toddler. I took a small step toward it. I wanted to see more. I needed to see more. The eyes, unblinking, remained in place. Getting closer didn't help reveal this thing. It seemed to absorb the light from my flashlight, almost devouring it. I couldn't make out its size or shape or color. It seemed to swallow up all the light around it, save for its two shimmering green eyes. That thing laughed in its hollow toddler's voice, this time with malice and cruelty in it. The eyes never looked away from me, never blinking, focused only on me, like a predator before the pounce. Not wanting to give up any ground to a predator, I stepped forward again. It didn't move. Not knowing what to do, I screamed as loud as I could. I waved my arms, trying futilely to shoo it away. The eyes shimmered. And as I stared back, the eyes shifted from green to amber. I watched as they began to rise up into the air. It was now apparent to me this thing had been crouching and was now standing up. I could only watch in silent terror as the eyes finally stopped rising, nearly 10 feet off the ground. The night air erupted with a deep growl. I could feel the vibrations in my guts. I couldn't see a mouth, but I could hear teeth snapping and gnashing. My son in the tent behind me began to scream. That was the only time the eyes lost focus on me and shifted towards the screams of my kid. 
My only reaction was to fire my gun into the air. The eyes immediately vanished. My ears were ringing, but I could hear the growls turn to shrieks, followed by a cacophony of crashing branches and undergrowth. I stood there until I couldn't hear the shrieking anymore. It trailed off deep into the trees. I was left with only the sound of the breeze in the treetops and the quiet sobbing of my child. Twilight was beginning to illuminate the forest. Shaking and exhausted, I sat down in the dirt in front of the tent. I tried to collect myself. Daddy, Daddy, where are you? My five-year-old shouted. That got me out of my daze. I picked myself up and went into the tent to retrieve him. Putting him in the truck, I locked the doors and wasted little time breaking down camp. We were out of that camp and back on the road by the time the sun broke over the horizon. I have no idea what is in those woods. I do plan to camp in that area again, albeit without my family, and definitely with some friends. I want to find out more about this thing. Thankfully, my son doesn't seem phased by anything that happened that night. He thinks I was chasing a bear away from camp. And maybe he's right. I hope he is anyway. My son can't wait to go on another camping trip. But, truthfully, I'm thinking the next family camping trip might be at an RV park. Or even a motel. That's family camping, right? Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. Get a good night's sleep, everyone. And I'll read to you in the next video. Bye-bye now.